surfer's ear is basically a condition where you experience bone growths in the ear canal. And as bone, bone growths enlarge and narrow the ear canal, people can experience water trapping, infections, hearing loss. And the reason it's been called surfer's ear is because the surfing population seems to have it a very, very high proportion. In fact, when Jack O'Neill invented the wetsuit, he really set this off because prior to that, people weren't spending a lot of time in cold water. Per capita, we have one of the highest rates in the world in this area. If we wanted to make this happen in somebody, we would just repeatedly dip them in and out of cold water. And the nature of the sport of surfing is that's exactly what that involves. The techniques I was using to address it initially were those that I was kind of taught in residency and learned from textbooks of ear surgery. And those typically involve using a drill in some fashion. My original motivation was concern about the noise of the drill, which in some cases has been measured up to 130 decibels. And that's where I thought the chisel technique would be so effective. But what I also found was it was far easier to protect the skin once you knew the technique. And people healed faster and they experienced less post-operative pain. So, um, there are a number of factors that made it really advantageous for the patient. Um, but from a surgeon's standpoint, having, knowing what I know now, it's sort of like if someone took my chisels away and said I had to drill, I wouldn't do the operation. Some of these guys seem to be able to fill up their whole ear canal with bone. The biggest single piece I ever took out was about the size of the tip of my little finger. I think we're up to about 1,307 ears, and that's roughly 747 patients. And those patients have come from 25 states in the United States, um, eight foreign countries. I've had email inquiries from really all over the world. There was a surgeon that came from Miyazaki, Japan earlier this year, seen me do it. There was someone that came from Bordeaux, France a couple years ago to learn the technique. So it's gradually kind of finding its way in, into further and further parts of the world, but it's not as readily available outside of this area. So patients are still willing to travel to have this done. We basically started from scratch in terms of trying to figure out, okay, what instruments are gonna let us do this operation? And, and you know, every step of the way, is there something that could be done better? There are a number of prototypes that uh, had to be modified in a variety of ways, redesigning our instruments and modifying instruments to work better in the operating room. Worked with the Bausch & Lomb Storz, Medtronic company, Carl Storz USA, at developing some of these things. So we've worked with prototypes and modifications of those prototypes to get it to where it is today. There's no moral ambiguity about this operation. I mean, there's certain things where you can say, okay, we may try to do something for someone. Are we really accomplishing something? Do they get better on their own? Or is, is our intervention making a difference? In these, it's a very, very tangible thing for me and the patient. We can see what the problem is. We can see the obstruction. You can see why they're having problems. I mean, I'm, I'm sort of a, somewhat of an athlete myself, although I'm not really a surfer, but I know what it's like to kind of be on the sidelines and be sidelined from something you really love to do. So to help these people get back to what they love doing has been very gratifying. A number of years ago, one of my patients was quoted in the local newspaper as calling me the Michelangelo of ear surgery, which uh, I guess I consider a very favorable comparison. Um, using chisels, but uh, I've not created any tremendous works of art uh, other than some good-looking ear canals. 